Good morning, everyone. Uh, now I invite Mr. Atul Agarwal, the Chief Executive Officer of SecPens, to present his talk titled Android Exploitation and Protection, a one-click full chain view. Mr. Atul Agarwal is a technology enthusiast with over a decade of experience in building startups and nurturing talent. Atul is the founder of SecPens, a multi-fold barrier-breaking cybersecurity organization, which is trusted by the top government, intelligence, defense agencies, LEAs, and corporates. As a high school grad just out of school, Atul has previously co-founded a high-growth cybersecurity training and ad tech startup. Known for his technical prowess and country-first approach, he surely made a mark in the infosec space and has helped client organizations to be result-oriented and to make India a safer cyber place to live in. Welcome, Mr. Agarwal, over to you. Hi, thank you so much for the uh, warm introduction. So uh, my talk is going to be uh, on Android exploitation and uh, you know the mitigations and the protections. And uh, you know we are going to look at a one-click full chain view and accordingly, you know, we'll be dissecting this one click full chain. And, uh, you know, so we'll be looking at the various aspects of it. I'll just be sharing my screen. All right, okay. So um, a bit about SecFence. Uh, so SecFence, uh, we've been the pioneers of, you know, uh, defensive offensive security in India for about a decade. It's been, uh, you know, more than a decade we've been doing this. We are a research-based organization. Uh, we are focusing on uh, vulnerability research and exploit development. And, uh, you know, along with our in-house research teams, we have global alliances of researchers and uh, the companies to actually bring state-of-the-art capabilities in India. And uh, we really take pride in working with uh, the law enforcement, the government agencies, some corporates, you know, for advanced uh, you know, capabilities uh, in this space. Um, about me, so I'm Atul. Uh, I'm the founder and CEO of SecFence. I'm a technology enthusiast. Uh, I have a decade plus uh, experience with InfoSec. I have, uh, you know, I dropped out of high school for uh, starting this company. And, uh, you know, I've also co-founded a high growth cybersecurity training organization and also ad advertisement technology organization. I'm available on Twitter at this handle for any conversations post the slides. All right, okay, so enough uh, with the introductions now. Diving into the uh, core topic. So talking about one-click attacks. So one-click attack uh, is something that has been a lot in the news and the media uh, due to the, you know, uh, obvious reasons it has quite been there. And, you know, a lot of people have been talking about it. And I think uh, a lot of people know what one-click attacks are. But just to, you know, kind of recap this, one-click attacks are, uh, the attacks that actually just require the target to click on the link and that's it, right? And uh, after clicking on the link, the phone or the device gets compromised. Uh, this is, uh, you know, uh, this is uh, something which is opposed to a zero click wherein there's no interaction at all required. So this talk is about one click attacks. So we'll be focusing there. And, uh, you know, uh, the one click attacks uh, that we're looking at and the other aspects that we're talking about is uh, basically uh, related to the browser exploitation. So coming on the next slide. So if you see the life cycle of a one-click attack, right? A one-click attack typically looks like uh, this, where you have something called a remote code execution. The second step is a sandbox escape. And the third step is basically a local privilege escalation. So as we like to call it, RC, SBX, and LP. And if you see the targets, uh, in the first step, we are targeting the browser. In the second step, we are also targeting the browser, and in the third step, we are targeting the Android kernel. So, you know, we'll going we'll be going in depth about each of the steps. But this is how the you know life cycle of the attack is. So, uh, you know, usually all of you would have uh, all of you know all of you who's, uh, who are basically Android users, right? You would actually know that uh, you know you have to use Chrome. It's something which is default on all these on the Android devices, right? So that is why on Android, the most common attack surface, the initial attack surface is the browser, which is present everywhere, which is Google Chrome, right? So this is basically the browser that is shipped by default with Google Chrome, uh, with Android, and this is available on devices. 
then again you know they whenever for instance you open a link in gmail or twitter right the apps internal browser opens up right even that is a web view and that is also chromium based right that is also something which is based on the open source chrome project then uh, other browsers on android like samsung internet browser which a lot of people on samsung use on default edge uh, for android opera brave mi browser they're also actually chromium based right and uh, in fact mi browser has no sandbox which we'll just talk about later so as you can see even if you're not using chrome directly you're using chrome on android there are of course a few exceptions there is firefox which is using a different engine both for rendering and javascript but it is again uh, you know uh, you have to uh, it's again uh, you know a very limited very very small percentage that is there so mostly it's chrome everywhere so that is why most one click attacks start from here and uh, chrome would be the target for the remote code execution and the sbx parts of the exploit going on uh, we're looking at the chrome sandbox model what are the different you know uh, model in the chrome uh, process so this is like a screenshot that i've pulled out of phone i wanted to focus on the android part so you know uh, if you see the screenshot is from android device uh, the ones highlighted in the red they are basically tabs right so as you can know you can have a lot of tabs in chrome in fact chrome was the uh, you know pioneers of uh, so to say tab browsing right so there are a lot of tabs earlier you need to have open windows for everything so chrome actually came out with a model where they have a, had a container and they had a lot of tabs now all these tabs basically are renderers which actually show you the web page and all of these tabs are actually different processes which are sandbox they are called sand, uh, renderer processes and you know one process cannot talk to the other process you know until and unless of course you know you have uh, something like a cross origin to show sharing or you are doing something like post message or you know they are of course from the same origin right so unless and until that's the case when they are not from the same domain or the same origin or you know the um, i mean it's explicitly allowed by the website owners right by headers you, they really can't talk to each other right and if uh, the reason is that uh one website can be malicious that you've loaded and you know if you talk about some javascript related attacks or you know if let's say one website would be able to change the contents on the other website uh, it could actually potentially steal a lot of information from your already logged in accounts and so on so that is why these uh, processes are independent of each other uh, you know they actually are different processes also on android depending on the you know uh, site isolation and the other vectors and uh, these are the different you know uh, renders that open up so how uh, like if you have 10 renders you have 10 different processes and so on right so these renderers are sandboxed and then all of these renders are sandboxed inside something that we call a broker or a browser process right so this browser process is something which is more privileged it's something which basically is brokering uh, you know all the communication all the needs of the renderer and the os right so this is something which sits in between and this actually contains all the other browsers all the other tabs so this is how basically the you know uh, browser process looks like now uh, yeah okay now uh, moving on right so if you look if you look at the overview of the chrome sandbox model so you know uh, you can see chrome has basically the render space wherein the render is uh, you know it is basically browsing internally then we have something called mojo i will come to it soon and then we have the browser space and then the system right so as i said the render space is basically the one wherein all the different renders are running this is sandboxed and there's a pipe which is uh, here it's represented by mojo so it's basically a inter process communication uh, there are basically mojo ipc and there's a legacy ipc which is older which is being phased out and uh, you know then you have the browser space and uh, in the browser space you have basically the host for each render process and it's basically also an object and uh, you know that's uh, one of the one bit like a lot of one bitties you know are the uafs you know kind of come with replacing this the browser space basically has a lot of objects and uh, this is more privileged and this can actually do read write to the system which is android in our case and whatever you know data is to be sent back render process is doing uh, the browser process is doing everything for the uh, renderer and sending it back to the renderer process so as you can see basically it's like a brokered you know access uh, it's a privileged uh, it's a controlled access wherein everything goes through a specific predefined you know a mechanism like the ipc 
and uh, you know uh, the file system uh, for instance has to serve a file you have to upload a file to the render space or let's say you have to you know uh, kind of uh, write a file to the disk so all of this goes through the mojo ipc right so this is how basically the chrome sandbox model looks like wherein you have a agent uh, which is the broker uh, sorry you have an agent you have a broker and basically the system the os itself right so this is how the uh, sandbox uh, model works on chrome Moving ahead, if you see, we will talk about uh, the first step now, remote code execution. So all of you would have heard about uh, remote code execution as we popularly call it RCE, right? So in computer security, uh, this is uh, from Wikipedia, computer security, arbitrary code execution or remote code execution is basically the attacker's ability to run any commands or code of the attacker's choice on a target machine or in a target process, right? So in our context, what we're talking about is we are looking at a remote code execution uh, in the renderer. So let's look at the remote code execution. So now when we talk about remote code execution in context of Chrome, right, we are talking about compromising the renderer, right? So if you quickly, uh, you know, come back to the, uh, you know, come back to the sandbox model, you would remember that this renderer is sandbox, right? So basically this renderer is something which is running uh, on a isolated app context. So this is a uh, SLNX context on Android, uh, wherein you know all the apps, all the applications are given a certain uh, you know privilege, privilege level, and uh, the Chrome render process runs in isolated app. So when this runs in isolated app, the Chrome render itself is sandboxed, and uh, you know there are of course other uh, methods also to make the sandbox uh, better. So that we'll look at a bit later. But uh, the point here to understand is that even if we compromise the Chrome's renderer, right? we are not able to really do much, right? It's like, you know, for instance, let's say if we do a RC on a, on a simple application, you could actually get the uh, you know, privileges on which it is running, right? You could read files or do much more. But in context of Chrome, compromising the renderer will not give you a lot. It would probably give you, you know, uh, it, will, uh, will, it will basically give you ability to actually just start the next stage of the attack uh, without sandbox escape, a compromised render is not really very useful. You cannot really do much privileged tasks. You can't really read or write any file to or from the disk. You can't access third-party cookies because of site isolation and the sandbox. You can't access a lot of drivers. So uh, it's a very limited, uh, you know, uh, limited success that you get. But what you can essentially get is the ability to actually start and execute the next stage, which is the sandbox escape. Right. So if you look at a typical RC flow, right, how does a remote code execution look like? Uh, so first uh, in the browser, uh, you know, context. So just to, uh, you know, add the other aspects to it. So it typically starts with clicking on a link. You click on a link or, you know, you visit a web page or, you know, someone uh, makes you visit a web page with the embedded iframe, you know, which is called a water holding attack. But, you know, you have to basically open the exact exploit code on your renderer. And once that happens <clears throat> using different vulnerabilities that we'll shortly discuss, right? We actually gain uh, arbitrary address write or read. So once we have this arbitrary address write or read, you know, we basically compromise the render. So, you know, what this uh, arbitrary address write or read means is that we can actually uh, via JavaScript or our, you know, primitives, we can actually do, uh, you know, manipulations of the renderer's memory, right? So within the renderer, we can actually, uh, we have compromised the render, so we can do actually anything in the render itself uh, and the render process also. So, you know, we can actually enable uh, some flags, uh, which if required by the exploit, we usually do that. You would have seen some Mojo JS uh, based, uh, you know, bindings being enabled by the uh, remote code execution exploit. So what this basically does is this enables the remote, uh, you know, uh, bindings of Mojo via JavaScript interface. So this can be done. Uh, you can actually enable some experimental features. You know, there have been some bugs in the past wherein, uh, you know, the experimental features were turned on by, uh, you know, by uh, this exploit. And uh, you can actually also, uh, you know, uh, look at uh, different, uh, you know, for, for instance, there was a portals exploit, which was in the wild just a while back. And that actually required you to turn on the flags because, uh, those flags, uh, the portal is not, uh, you know, enabled by default everywhere. There was a BF cache exploit, backward forward cache, which also required you to actually enable the flags. So, you know, uh, once you have the arbitrary read write, you can actually enable a lot of flags there. 
that's something which is uh, possible with the uh, you know with the render exploitation or the compromised render further on you can actually also patch the render so when we say patch the render it means that you know you can actually uh, you know like kind of make changes on the render itself you can uh, you know compromise the renderer and uh, you can actually add some code uh, you know you can actually hijack a function you can add your own function you can replace uh, something which you don't require, uh, you know, for the next stage of exploit, and you can actually patch the byte codes or the assembly there on the render itself. So that because you have the arbitrary access in the memory, so you can actually do pretty much there. And then finally, you know, uh, in a typical remote code execution, the last step is usually to actually uh, exploit uh, the sandbox escape bug. So it could be through shell code or through Mojo JS, depending on how the bug is. So this is a very uh, high level, very extremely high level overview. Of a typical flow of the RC, you know, I wanted to uh, just tell you that you know I wanted to kind of discuss the different aspects involved and also the limitations, right? So if you see uh, compromising a renderer doesn't really give you anything useful. Like I mean, you can't really take out any contact from the device. You can't take out any data from the device. You can't really you know do a lot of uh, you know uh, you know any any data gathering. What you can do is you can simply do internal uh, tweaking of the uh, renderer so that you can actually prepare and execute the next stage. So uh, render exploit in isolation is not really useful, right? Uh, but yes, of course, if you are using a browser like MI browser, which I mentioned, there's no sandbox ship with it. You actually have, uh, you know, the whole uh, permissions or privilege levels of MI browser as soon as you do that, because uh, they do not ship with sandbox. So it really depends uh if the you know uh if the chromium uh, fork or the chromium you know derivative uh, derived project is actually a switch and sandbox or not but typically they are and that is why uh, rc itself is not very useful but it's extremely useful in the case of chain right that's why it's a full chain when we say a full chain it basically means uh sandbox uh, the remote code execution sandbox escape and then further on the local privilege escalation that's how a typical rc looks like and some examples of uh, RC uh, exploits, uh, you know, uh, are, uh, you know, these, as you can see on the screen. So I would just like to point out here that there are two components on the render. Uh, I would say basically Chrome has two components. One is the V8 engine, which is basically the JavaScript engine of Chrome. It's uh, everything that you see in JavaScript is basically, you know, managed by V8. It's actually V8. V8 is also something that you would see in Electron, Node, JS, that also runs on V8. So it's a quite popular library. Uh, it's a quite popular project that's basically, you know, uh, forms the core of Chrome and that's a JavaScript engine. So some, some examples of uh, some exploits, uh, for example, there was out of bound read, right? Which is the CV 2020-6418. There was a just in, uh, so, you know, uh, V8 engines, you know, in order to optimize a lot, they have just in time, uh, you know, uh, just in time, uh, you know, engines wherein you can actually convert uh, this, the system automatically converts a frequently used function into a byte code, right? And then you can actually cause type confusion or some side effects. So there's another example, which is quite recent that was exploited in the wild, which was also just in time. Bar. So this, these are uh, V8 uh, dependent exploits. And then you have the blink. Blink is the rendering engine, right? So everything else, which is not exactly JavaScript is blink. It's the web audio. It's uh, some sort of graphic processing that happens inside, you know, the renderer and the, you know, uh, other aspects of it. So that's all Blink. So Blink is the rendering engine. V8 is the JavaScript engine. And in the Blink, uh, you know, for example, there very recently there was a UAF in the web audio which had the CV 15.972, and uh, this was Blink. So regardless of if it's V8 or if it's Blink, both are sandboxed, and uh, you know, uh, successful exploitation of these would again give us probably the read write primitives and then the typical flow is the same, right? So that's how we actually start with the exploit. So the important thing to remember is that this, these exploits are, uh, you know, uh, processed inside the renderer. It is something which basically, you know, is very difficult to actually, uh, you know, kind of be known by the Android host what's happening inside them, right? Uh, because it's a sandboxed, uh, you know, model, it really does not have a lot of side effects. You can, uh, you know, use, you, you can actually use this to escalate to the next level, but by itself, it cannot really do a lot. So that's basically RCs for you. Now let's talk about sandbox escape, right? Uh, sandbox escape, uh, before sandbox escape, let's see what a sandbox is, right? We've discussed sandbox is basically a hardened container 
in which the render process runs. It's basically you you know hardened using multiple things on Android, for instance. It basically is hardened using a Selenium context, and there's a COMBPF, which is basically filtering of syscalls and so on, right? So there are different aspects to a sandbox on Android. Uh, there's a screenshot which is Android specific. If you go to your Android device or your Chrome browser and actually write Chrome then colon slash slash sandbox, you will see the sandbox status of your system. On Windows, you will see different uh, you know components. On Android, you will see different. On Linux, you will see pretty much the same, but some more uh, different things. So this is the sandbox status. As you can see, it says what is the PID, the UID, the SA Linux context. You can see it's isolated app. Uh, so basically it's the renderers uh, context. And then you see that the seccom BPF is enabled for both kernel and Chrome and what is the Android build and so on. So basically this is uh, to say that, you know, your system is, um, your system is basically, you know, uh, sandboxed the Chrome uh, render, uh, sorry, the Chrome browser process is sandboxed and, uh, you know, you have different uh, renders running. What is the UID PID and so on. But uh, the point here is that you can actually utilize the remote code execution for launching the next stage. Now, how does a typical sandbox escape looks like? Now, so there are different vulnerabilities again, different classes of bugs on a sandbox escape as well. So we'll talk about a typical uh, UAF case, uh, use after free in uh, you know in Google Chrome uh, browser process. So usually, you know, once we get a dangling pointer after the UAF or after we've identified the UAF. We get a dangling pointer. We replace the target object with the control data, usually with the spray. And then once we are able to, you know, replace the target object with control data, uh, we actually use the target object, which in turn allows us to hijack the vtable functions. And you know, uh, since we've sprayed with our own, uh, you know, objects there, we can hijack the vtable function, pivot it to, you know, uh, the shell code, and then we actually gain code execution in the untrusted app context, right? So quickly, if you remember here, the untrusted app context, uh, if someone, you know, uh, if, you, if you guys have dealt with Android uh, apps, right? This is the similar context that you get actually after installing an app, right? So essentially at this stage, you have all the privileges that Chrome browser would have generally, right? So we'll talk about this a bit later also, but important point to uh, note here is that earlier you, we were in isolated app context, which was a sandboxed context. Now, we are in untrusted app context and the seccom bpf and the other filters also do not apply here uh, and you know we basically can be ready for our next stage which is local privilege escalation right so it's like the flow starts from uh, you know exploiting a uaf spraying it and then hijacking the vtable functions and then you know finally getting the code execution in the untrusted app context that's how typically a lp is launched going further you know uh, let's look at some recent sandbox examples there's a UAF use after free in index DB, uh, which was again exploited in the wild. So this is 30633 CV. This is a pretty interesting bug. Uh, there was a recent write up also for which, uh, which was released for this, uh, just I think yesterday or day before yesterday. Then there was a heap buffer overflow, which is uh, convert to Java bitmap. So this, this bug uh, 16010 was also exploited in the wild. Initially, this was only thought to be on Android, but then variant analysis and other aspects led to confirm that this bug is also available on Windows. So these are two uh, category of bugs. Then we also have interesting hardware bugs on, uh, you know, to escape sandbox. In fact, uh, you know, the hardware bugs, uh, there's a good write-up by Project Zero, which I've linked here, uh, was basically, you know, uh, using uh, hardware bugs to actually, you know, uh, kind of get to leak the Mojo port secret. So basically what, what happens is that as we discussed, there's an IPC mechanism, inter-process communication, Mojo-based, where there's a, you know, there's this basically the two processes, one on the render side, one on the browser side. And if you are able to leak the, you know, the Mojo secret key for uh, privileged processes like network and other privileged, uh, you know, uh, processes, we can actually uh, do a lot of, uh, you know, interesting things. This uh, great blog post actually, talks about, you know, um, talks about uh, the leaking a uh, you know, key and then further on, it basically led to the exploit by writing a file on the disk. So this is quite a great write-up, you could look at it, but the point here is that hardware bugs can also lead to sandbox escape. Uh, then further, uh, you know, you have a category of bugs which are basically sandbox accessible kernel bugs, right? So here in there was a kernel bug called uh, Badbinder, it got quite popular. It was, uh, you know, uh, found in the wild. 
uh, and this bug was uh, basically a bug in the binder IPC. So binder IPC is the inter-process communication mechanism that Android uses. It's a Linux extension exclusively for Android and that had a bug. So there were two bugs on Android. Uh, uh, sorry, this, this is two to one. There have been a lot of bugs on Android. This is the most popular one. They followed with uh, more binder bugs. So, uh, you know, this is a Linux bug. This is not a Chrome exploit, but as I said that, uh, you know, the render process, it cannot do a lot of things, but essentially it has to use the operating systems IPC, right? That IPC is binder and that is why this bug is actually accessible from the sandbox. So, in fact, in order to exploit these bugs, you know, you really don't, I mean, you can actually combine your uh, sandbox and the Linux uh, and the LP together. So it can be one shot, you know, sandbox escape and a, a local project creation done together. So this was one very popular bug that came about. It was also a sandbox escape in a way. Then there was a very recently patched bug in November, 2021. This was a uh, ePoll related bug, which was quite interesting. This got patched multiple times. Project Zero has done a, a, you know, kind of a deep analysis on it, a root cause analysis on this. This bug was <coughs> exploited multiple times, uh, was patched multiple times actually. This bug came in due to a fixing of another bug and then you know, uh, this the fix actually uh, caused some regression and introduced another bug. That bug was patched in the upstream, but it could not be really patched on the you know uh, Android uh, security bulletins. This was released on Android security bulletins, but did not go to a lot of phones. Then this was exploited, and finally it was patched again. So quite a interesting history of this bug. If you would like to read it, uh, Project Zero has a good uh, deep dive on it. And then uh, you have some bugs like uh, logic or implementation bugs. For example, there was a project zero bug again on uh, legacy IPC. Uh, you know, if you remember, we have two IPC mechanisms. There is a Mojo IPC and there is a legacy IPC. Legacy is the one we rolled out, uh, sorry, being uh, phased out. So legacy IPC has some, uh, you know, some, some uh, issues like there was a shared memory issue when we could actually access the shared memory and cause, you know, a sandbox escape. So that was a logic and implementation bug and, and much more. So these are some examples of sandbox escapes, which are basically, uh, you know, used in, which, which were present or observed in the wild or some POCs are available. So this is basically sandbox escape for you. Now, uh, after a sandbox is done, what happens? Uh, as I was mentioning, you get code execution in untrusted app context, right? It's similar to actually uh, having an app installed on the phone, right? So if you have Android, you can actually sideload an application. You really get whatever, uh, permissions you have by you know with chrome right so you can actually leverage chrome permissions so if you don't have a local privilege escalation exploit you just have rc and sbx you know what you can do is you can actually utilize uh you know you can utilize the uh you know uh, utilize the permissions which are with chrome so for example uh you can see on the on the image right chrome by default has camera contacts files and media location microphone. So pretty much a lot of, uh, you know, your personal data access to your personal data. And uh, if someone has done a RC and SBX, they can actually use your camera. They can get your contacts. They can get your files and media location microphone because they are actually essentially running code inside Chrome and as untrusted app, right? So they can actually do a lot of it. You can actually write files. You can access drivers and much more, but you cannot really access private data of other applications. You cannot access WhatsApp. And you cannot persist for longer. You can't really do injections if you want to record calls and so on. So for that, you need to do the next step, which is LP. So uh, you know when we talk about the private, uh, you know data, right? Uh, if you also install an app, you can't really access WhatsApp, right? It's not possible to access the WhatsApp uh, directory with a, just an app installed. If you wanted to do that, you would have to root your phone or do a temp root, which is basically what essentially a LP also does. It gives you a root-like privileges. And just to point here, the Chrome permissions, uh, you know, can be leveraged. Uh, you know, uh, some attacks in the while actually did that. There's a link I've mentioned here, wherein they were just doing RC and SBX and using the browser's permissions to actually steal a lot of files. So that's something that you see in the while sometimes uh, if the attacker doesn't really, don't really have, uh, you know, some sort of uh, LP. Now moving on from SBX to the local privilege escalation. So LP, as the name says, it basically escalates your privileges locally. So it mostly targets the Linux kernel components or chipset drivers, basically the Linux kernel. And, uh, you know, you basically get root or root-like privileges. I say root-like privileges for a reason because a lot of LPs 
don't really actually give you the kernel read write or uid zero but they actually you know leave you in a state where you can you are privileged enough to do a lot of things so we'll talk about that later so quickly let's look at android how android is stacked you have hardware then you have linux kernel then you have android framework and then apps on top of it this is again much uh, very simplified version of how it looks like and the lp typically targets the linux kernel uh, stack or the android framework in some cases but uh, you know these are this because these are privileged right and sometimes it basically targets hardware but so linux kernel drivers of the hardware so you know there were a bunch of bugs that we'll discuss which were actually targeting the uh, you know uh, drivers and the kernel itself so that's basically an lp now what does it sorry how does the lp look like so the lp is uh, you know I, i'm assuming there's uh, some there's no mitigation uh, on this device this is not a samsung device basically so how it basically happens is that using the bug using the kernel bug or the driver bug you get kernel read write primitives so you know once you have kernel read write primitives you can actually set sl linux to permissive or you can inject your own policy you can patch the cred offsets so that you actually become a uid zero or similar or you know again this is very very simplified view you can actually pivot from here do a injection into another process like zygote instead of actually patching the creds and then depending on the different mitigations and then you basically can run or install your agent right so essentially what we're talking about is uh, this again leads to memory corruption or memory manipulation and then you can actually patch a lot of different structures in the memory so that you're able to get code execution as you like it right you can actually elevate your privileges and then you become uh, some sort of a temp root it's not a permanent root it will uh, go immediately as you restart this is something just very temporarily and uh, lp will give you uid zero or similar privileges and then typically what most chains do is they install or run an agent or a shell code or an application which does the job right uh, whatever the intended uh, work is so that's basically how a typical lp goes going further uh, let's look at some lp examples there have been a lot of lp examples like you know uh, there, there are chipset bugs on lp uh, let's there were there were two bugs in fact both of them were patched in may 2021 one was uh, these again are I've, i've tried to take most of the in the wild exploited examples so you can actually read more about that or you can if possible there might be some pocs also so uh, this chipset specific bugs uh, one was in qualcomm display driver one was in mali driver um, the qualcomm display driver is basically uh, all phones with uh, you know you could say with snapdragon uh, you know chipset or system on a chip soc and the mali driver is basically arm mali uh, gpu which is present on most of the non uh, you know qualcomm phones right so for example if you talk about Exynos, which is again a SOC by Samsung. You are looking at, you know, MediaTek. That also a lot of time uses Mali. Uh, so you know, if you just think about it, if you just combine the Qualcomm Display Driver and the Mali Driver bugs together, if you have both of these LPs, you can actually pretty much target most of the phones which are present for Android, right? Uh, and in a LP basis, and both of them were actually being exploited by, uh, you know, some threat actors and. they were uh, chipset specific so it's a very powerful bug right wherein you can actually regardless of uh, really the kernel version and the other configurations you were able to exploit because they were in the driver or the chipsets so that's uh, this was quite interesting so i thought i'd highlight it here uh, further you have uh, the linux kernel components you know like binder uh, and uh, you know you have like two binder bugs you have a epol bug so you know i mentioned that some lps uh, again if you remember they are accessible from sandbox Th that's why they don't require a separate sandbox escape right i mean you could uh, after render compromise you can run the lp uh, or the sandbox escape whatever you want to call it uh, twice or directly you know you can run it once and get root privileges directly from this from the render itself so that, that's also possible if you have a local privilege escalation that is accessible from the sandbox so that's basically some linux kernel components based uh, lps and again uh, there was a recent one which was 0399 this was not exploited in the wild but recently uh, there was a you know uh, i think there was a write up by uh, google uh, team a uh, google kernel team and they actually showed how to exploit this bug this is a bug which is quite interesting this was there for about 10 years on android and uh, this was submitted by a researcher and it was thought to be unexploitable but they exploited it by after defeating a lot of modern uh, you know the mitigations on android so these are the uh, linux kernel components of course there are a lot more components a lot more bugs this is again a very uh, high level examples overview
Uh, then we have Android framework exploits. So sometimes, you know, uh, the bug is there in Android framework on how it process the permission, how it actually process the installation, how it processes the, you know, uh, the uh, communication mechanism, the networking and so on. So the Android framework is privileged. Uh, of course, it's more privileged than the app uh, or the untrusted app context, uh, you know, app that is running. So sometimes, you know, the LPs target the Android framework and they give you root-like privileges. So root-like privileges mean that you can actually install anything silently. You could actually, you know, uh, probably uh, get all the permissions automatically. You could do much more, uh, but it's not UID zero, right? So, but those also can be counted in LPs. It's something which gets the job done. It's not UID zero, but it gets the job done, right? So that's what a typical LP would look like. So now uh, these are the different, uh, you know, uh, cycles. So we complete a uh, cycle uh, when we talk about the LP, uh, SBX and RC in the reverse order. And, uh, you know, I would like to show you a small demonstration. Uh, there's a pre-recorded uh, demonstration that I would like to show, right? Which basically, uh, you know, will show how the um, complete chain would work. Of course, a uh, lot of, you know, the components would not be directly visible here, but you could actually see, you know, different things uh, happening. So just let me pull the video and show it. Right, okay, so. All right, so I'm just sharing the video. I'm just playing the video out. Um, so I hope everyone is able to see this. Right, so what, what's happening is, uh, you know, we are basically in the, Okay, so let's just pause a bit and explain what's happening at each stage. So what we did is simply we started, a, all right, on the, we took an ADB shell. ADB is basically Android debug bridge. And we basically started on the device itself. We started a Netcat listener uh, because our ultimate uh, payload would be a reverse shell. So we'll get this connection on port 3337, which is elite. Uh, you know, so yeah, so this would uh, basically get the connection back. So we are just uh, doing it on the local host itself, on the device itself. So we've started the port listening. We start Chrome. As you can see on the Chrome, uh, so this is the end day, of course, which is a patch bug. So let's see the sandbox status. As you can see, the sandbox, it says you're adequately sandboxed and you know, it gives you the different, uh, you know, uh, components. Uh, okay. Sure. Yeah. Uh, I can only see the demo screen. So if you're showing oh, okay. the terminal, it's not currently visible. All right. Okay. Thanks for pointing that out. Uh, give me a second. Is it is it visible now? Uh, yes, yes, yes. All right. Okay. Okay. I'm so sorry. And thanks for pointing that out. I'll just go over it quickly. So we just start, we log in, we kind of connect to the Android debug bridge. We start the reverse shell, like the shell listener on the three in this port and uh, what we do is we open a browser we basically look at the chrome sandbox status so the chrome sandbox is adequately sandboxed and then what we do is we actually go to okay so the chrome version also it's an end day that uh, targets chrome 90 Right, so we're going to the exploit. So the first stage would run, the SBX would run and the LP would run all automatically. So here we are just running everything in the background. So the RC is running. And as soon as the RC would be successful, it will launch the next stage, which would be the sandbox escape. And as soon as the sandbox escape would run, it will launch the next stage, which is the local privilege escalation. And as soon as that is done, we will have the, you know, uh, we should have the shell back, right? So that would be the process of the whole exploit. So as you can see, it can take some bit of time, really depending on the different bugs. Okay, so now you can see that we have got a shell back. And if you write ID, it is 
ID zero. And if you write who am I, it would say root, right? So uh, in this flow, and we, we've redirected to the to a different website post the compromise has happened. This is process continuity. So we've redirected to example.com, but once the exploit happened, you would see that you know uh, the different aspects are done and you actually get a UID zero. So this is how a simple uh, you know chain kind of works. Of course, here they typically the targets won't do a you know a UID zero or reverse shell. They would go ahead and install a silent application, patch some you know different things in Android so they can remain more uh, hidden and so on. So that's how it really happens. So this was the video coming back to the uh, you know presentation again. Give me a second. Right. Okay. I hope the uh, presentation is visible now. Yes. All right. Thank you. Uh, okay. So this was how a typical, you know, uh, things, uh, the typical exploit looks like. And of course, this is again a high level overview. So now we talk about some mitigation and hardening. And again, this is a non-comprehensive list because we're talking about so many different components here. Uh, the Chrome uh, browser itself, you know, uh, we talk about both RC and SBA. They have a lot of different mitigations. Uh, bundled together so you have uh, you know render memory protection but that can be bypassed using a web assembly just in time rwx page you have site isolation and sandbox escape uh, they are basically vulnerability triggered so you can have info leaks you can have vulnerabilities and they get bypassed you have memory caging which is upcoming there's no public bypass but a couple of people have private bypasses and you know as they become more mainstream you'll have some uh, public mitigations also public bypasses also you have aslr but on Android and Windows, you know, we have week per boot uh, ASLR, which means that, you know, every time your system starts up, you know, uh, the some poor libraries, the system libraries, they are given a fixed address because uh, the Zygote process spawns all the other processes on, uh, you know, Android, including the render processes and the browser process. So that's a common area for exploiting uh, or, you know, bypassing the ASLR on the Chrome browser. And you talk about the Linux kernel, then you have, uh, the kernel ASLR, you have again info leaks and different vulnerabilities. You have some mitigations or you know protection like SLNX, DAC, SecComp. These are mostly you know uh, exploitable once you have the kernel read write. I mean exploitable or patchable or bypassable. Uh, you have something on Samsung which is uh, Samsung's real time kernel protection. So this is called Samsung RKP or Knox. If you you know uh, look at your high end Samsung phone, you will see there's a Samsung Knox version running. There have been a lot of bypasses for this. There are known public bypasses of this at the time we speak also. This presentation gives you a very good overview on the you know, uh, different uh, bypasses available for Samsung RKP. Uh, quickly elaborating on Samsung RKP, how this works is basically this kind of you know, uh, moves some uh, privileged operations into a hypervisor. And uh, you know, for example, the CRED patching cannot happen because anything that has to do with CRED goes through the hypervisor, which are the additional checks. And some data, uh, some structures are protected, like SLNX enforcing variables are actually protected by K, uh, you know, KDP, which is kernel data protection. So this is a uh, very, uh, you know, this is this is an involved, uh, I would say, uh, you know, a protection mechanism. But then again, the bypasses are there, so it's not completely, uh, you know, uh, unhackable. And then you have Linux kernel configurations, and they can also be bypassed with different, you know, attack techniques. So, you know, this is a this is a general thing, right? I mean, we know that nothing can be 100% uh, secure and uh, nothing is unhackable, but this says that there are a lot of different, uh, you know, challenges when you try to exploit a bug, right? Or rather a full chain on a Linux kernel and, uh, you know, uh, or an Android device uh, or a RC or a SBX. And there's so many mitigations, but everything has a bypass, right? On different uh, ways. So that's basically something, you know, which you can actually look at from this list. Um, and uh, all of these mitigations, of course, re might require dedicated bugs by themselves. This could require, you know, a bug itself by their own. This could require, you know, an exploit of their own. But all of these uh, are possible to escape and bypass. And this is basically a mitigation, uh, you know, uh, non-comprehensive list of mitigations. Again, there are a lot of mitigations which are more difficult and, you know, more challenging. But, you know, I just wanted to kind of bring in all the mitigations that really are hampering a typical attack list, uh, attack chain, and these are it. Now moving on to the detection. So if you see, uh, lastly, we'll talk about detection, right? So how, how can we detect these attacks happening, right? So the first most commonly uh, done attack, uh, and this is true for RCs, I would say, is URL scanning, right? So 
for example let's say i'm sending a link over a sms or over a whatsapp message uh, you know uh, the the service provider can scan the url to actually detect the initial stage this is not very effective because you can actually do a geo locking you can do firewalls you you, know, you can actually sniff the user agent you could actually sniff the browser and do a lot of things to know that this is not the intended target and you really don't serve the active payload because the thing with the uh, one click chain is that it's a dynamic chain it's something that is constantly talking back to the servers it's not a static file like a word document that you're sending or it's not an executable that you're actually sending to the target it's a very involved process so you do a lot of back and forth with the server and server can actually ask a lot of things from the client and if it's not satisfied it simply won't serve the exploit right so that's why the url scanning is not really all the time useful for targeted attacks but again you know uh, it can lead to some interesting results then second is the honeypots or deception so deception and honeypots what they mean is they actually emulate an end to end you know attack chain and uh, this is effective to some extent but uh, you know exploit stages again are very smart because you can as you can understand exploits are quite uh, you know challenging to create they are quite expensive so they the exploit the stages they have multiple checks at each stage to in, to actually ensure that they are able to detect honeypots like you have a lot of detections for you know uh, a lot of detection for a lot of things emulator detection the developer mode detections you know the device detection the gpu detection and you actually create a lot of you know one time key for each exploit process so a lot of these are done and then accordingly this is done and you know you would see uh, project zero has a good write up on this then chrome telemetry is there wherein you can actually do a lot of you know collection of data this uh, if your exploit crashes it actually goes to chrome and they can actually get this exploit done and lastly you know uh, there is something called on device protection uh, this application verifier this does this apk this cannot actually catch lps or uh, chromium based exploits your vbpf monitoring this could be actually effective and useful for kernel exploit detection and then finally you have antivirus uh, and google play protect it's not really effective for getting exploits probably some agents which are known or backdoors which are actually known could be known but it's also something which is bypassable so on android it's pretty challenging to actually detect a you know a ongoing one click attack and the only way is that staying up to date but then again zero day is not something that can be stopped you know the nature because of the nature of it yeah, so that actually concludes the detection part and uh, in fact that concludes my uh, presentation on the topic and uh, yeah thank you guys uh, i would be happy uh, to undertake any questions if uh, if there are any uh you know on the presentation or any of the topics that we've covered and uh, you know looked at it and just as a side note we are hiring we are uh, having three open positions you can actually go to our website and actually you know apply for these we'd love to chat so that's that's from me guys uh, would love to entertain any questions if you're there Thank you so much, Mr. Atul, for this informative session. Um, unfortunately, we're a little tight on schedule, so right, right. probably have to just go to the mode of thanks right now. All right, no worries, uh, and I hope everyone uh, you know really gained something out of the talk. Thank you so much for the time. Thank you to, so much for the platform. Yeah. So thank you so much, Mr. Atul, for taking us through this informative session and giving us valuable insights on various topics like remote code execution, sandbox escape. Privilege escalation. It's flow and some interesting examples. We appreciate you taking some time off your busy schedule to deliver this talk. So thank you so much once again. Thank you so much. Thank you.